I'm joined now by Ole Miss Athletics Director Ross Bjork. He is joining us here on uh, this uh, special uh, video interview. Ross, thanks for coming on, man. Uh, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, Parrish. Thanks for having us on. Uh, I love this platform. What a great way to engage uh, with your readers and um, people online. So this is terrific. Well, you know, it's 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 a little bit different newspaper than uh, than several years ago, and uh, this has been a, an exciting platform. As as you mentioned, I had Mike Bianco on earlier this year, and and I'll tell you now, you know, you might need to do some fundraising for some new uh, computer equipment. It, it sounds like. Uh, Mike and, and maybe even yourself had to scramble a little bit to uh, to get the computer with the camera. Is that right? You know, um, I guess I'm sort of old school with my uh, you know my big desktop uh, computer over here. So I did have to borrow uh, an Apple uh, Mac uh, MacBook Air. So I got to catch up with the times here. Well, I tell you what, Ross, you, you really come across as tech savvy uh, on social media, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about a little bit, just a couple of recent instances where uh, where you really were out in front kind of supporting uh, the athletics department, supporting the, the university and, and even the, uh, the the city of Oxford. Uh, if, if you would, talk a little bit about uh, how you interact with opposing fans. There, there was a little bit of conversation with a, a Mississippi State fan yeah. last week. And before that, really kind of a, you know, a, a sensitive issue, uh, an off-the-cuff remark from a a Texas journalist that you responded to, yeah. What's what's your approach to social media? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Parrish. And I and I think um, you know in today's world of college athletics, I think to to really create uh, connections with people, I think has to be our our number one priority if we're to you know build our fan bases, you know keep people involved. Uh, there's so many things out there in society to distract people. Uh, away from us that I think we have to continue to engage people in social media is something that uh, when I became an athletic director at, at Western Kentucky I decided to to engage with uh, utilize that as a platform to to be able to communicate um, obviously it's uh, it's Twitter uh, from although Instagram is becoming more and more popular among the younger crowd but but Twitter has been a great way Really, for us to to put out a press release, you know, within within uh, a matter of seconds, and so you know, we we feel that um, if we're going to have it as part of our platform, that we better utilize it. We can't just let it sit idle and and not capture um, you know the strength of what social media can be. Now we also have the flip side of it that it can be dangerous, um, and and we've all seen that as well. So, you know, as far as those specific instances uh, that you're referring to. Uh, one I thought was was a very serious um, attack on, on our people, uh, and that's the one that you mentioned um, from the Texas. Um, I guess he's a beat writer over there uh, that covers the University of Texas. Since then, you know, he's apologized to me personally. Obviously, he he owned that situation and apologized, uh, you know, to the masses that are out there. And then, you know, the one that we had fun with last week. Uh, with the with the belt, the wrestling belt, the TNA wrestling belt. Where did the belt come from, Ross? You had that like in a moment's notice. You had a wrestling belt. How many agents have that? I had I, I got the wrestling belt uh, from our good friend uh, Dixie Carter, who owns uh, TNA Wrestling. She's an Ole Miss grad. Uh, she lives in Nashville. You know, obviously, you know, wrestling is an entertainment uh, company, TNA Wrestling, and so I had that belt in my office. And you know, really, what happened was is you know the the gentleman was tweeting at me so much and i kept seeing it as i would uh you know refresh my my twitter page uh, throughout the really the last uh, 8 to 10 days uh before we did this and i said okay you know what it's time to have a little fun it's time to to really you know he was trying to bait me but i think we ended up uh, baiting him a little bit by saying you know what hey let's uh why don't you give to old miss athletics you're tweeting about us so much you must be a rebel and uh, just some fun. So I think 98% of the people uh, realized that moment was purely for fun, uh, purely to showcase that if we really can't laugh at ourselves and laugh with ourselves, then uh, you know what good is uh, is life? Um, I, I believe so. We've got to have fun uh, with this stuff, and, and social media to me is a great way to do it. And um, you know it uh, it played out uh, I think in the spirit that it was meant to be, and he came back and apologized and. And uh, it's all worked worked out from there. Well, Ross, let's uh, move on a little bit. Can you update us 
facilities, the arena specifically. I, I, well, I guess before you have the arena, you have the parking garage. It looks like that's pretty close. But uh, if you would, tell us when the garage might be finished and if the arena is still uh, on target. Yeah. We could spend a whole show, Parrish, uh, talking about facilities. You know, there's so much going on. You know, right now, we've either uh, wrapped up or under construction, you know, $100 million worth of uh, facilities with, with more to come. So right now, you know, obviously the Manning Center is done. We've utilized that facility. We actually just won an award uh, from the University of Southern Miss on, uh, on the best facility project in the 2 to $10 million range, being the Manning Center. Uh, Pavilion at Ole Miss is under construction. You see a lot of concrete coming out of the ground. You'll actually start seeing steel. Uh, being uh, erected uh, the first week in December, so we're really going to start seeing things come out of the ground at the pavilion. Uh, the garage, you can see the exterior of the garage has a lot of brick that's almost done, and they're completing the what they call the topping slabs that are inside the uh, the parking garage, and then they're really cleaning up and, and finalizing the loading dock area, which are in to the to the arena to the pavilion. So the parking garage, we expect it to open uh, sometime in January to be ready by the start of the semester in uh, January. Obviously, we won't have it for this football season, but I think we've managed accordingly. So that's coming along nicely. And then the pavilion is, uh, is on schedule for December of 2015. And we're working on, you know, what's the opening uh, act in that, uh, in that building? Is it a game? Is it a concert? Uh, what type of uh, ceremonial event will take place? So all those things are coming together. And then we're looking at uh, Vaught-Hemingway Stadium. So we're going out to bid uh, the first week in December around the South End Zone Complex. And that'll include 30 new suites, 700 club seats that'll take place in the South End Zone. And then by uh, summer of 2015, we'll start uh, some preliminary work on the North End Zone. And to have that ready um, for the 2016 season. And hopefully in the next couple of weeks, Parrish, we're going to have a... Uh, really a kind of a press conference, if you will, an unveiling of Vaught-Hemingway Stadium, you know, final plans. Here's what the north end zone looks like. Here's what the plazas look like. Here's what the exterior looks like, and have it all tied together. And hopefully uh, we can make that announcement before the end of the football season this year. And uh, we're tracking towards that. And uh, stay tuned, I, I think, is the key message for both media and our fans so we can uh, we can announce that project. So it, it sounds like uh, there could be uh, ongoing construction around the north end zone during the 2015 season. Is, is that what I'm hearing? That's correct. We'll, we'll manage it in a way where we still operate the, the grandstand, still operate our concessions and restrooms, uh, but we think that we can do some preliminary work uh, next summer and during the course of the season and then kind of close it all up uh, during game day and then have everything ready to tear down those bleachers uh, really as soon as that last whistle blows. In, uh, for the 2015 season to be ready for 2016. So that's our timeline. And again, in the next couple of weeks, we hope to be able to, to announce all these things to, uh, to show people uh, what's, what's happening uh, in, a, in a real form. We've kind of had some starts and, and stops, if you will, but now we can show people this is what's happening. Here's the design. Here's what it looks like. Here's the exact timeline. And uh, we're, we're pretty close to having that ready. Ross, it's been a, a very successful football season so far, several big games still to come. Uh, as, you, as you look at Hugh Freeze and, and his contract, and you rewarded him and his staff last year, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, an old saying uh, when Pete Boone was athletics director, he used to talk about the price of poker, and <laughs> the, price, the price of poker is always out there. You know, what type of challenge do you face in keeping Hugh Freeze's contract current and uh, keeping him uh, at a competitive salary at Ole Miss. Right. Well, that, that game will still be played. That poker game will still be played, uh, as Pete alluded to. And, you know, the, the way I look at it is, is really if we believe in a coach, like we believe in Coach Freeze, we believe in his staff, that, you know, every time there's a chance to, to reward that or to, to solidify the future and provide that continuity, it, which is so important in, in today's environment, is continuity. You know, we want to do that. And so the same thing will apply. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer um, in, you know, a consistent approach. And, and I love the way we've done it the last couple of years, uh, working with Coach and his representative. And we've already started a, a process of engagement. And um, we'll, we'll continue the same type of format that as the season 
you know, winds down as the season ends, the regular season ends, uh, that we'll be in a position to, uh, you know, again, solidify, you know, coach and his staff and his future um, around continuing to, to invest in, in Ole Miss football. And I think that's really what it is. I mean, people drive uh, success, and we have to continue to invest in people, uh, especially those that we believe in like we do in, in Coach Freeze and like we did with Mike Bianco and, and Andy Kennedy and all of our coaches. But those those things will come together uh, as the season, uh, you know, wraps up. And, you know, as far as securing, the, obviously the SEC network is helping but we're selling more season tickets than ever before. We have more donors than ever before. And so we, we've really, really never been healthier at, uh, financially. Um, but now we have to manage that growth. We have to make sure we do the right things and, and be good stewards of, of resources. And uh, we'll continue to, to operate with that mindset. How important, Ross, you mentioned baseball. How important was the College World Series just uh, in terms of uh, solidifying uh, Ole Miss baseball in the national uh, mindset, and, and just you know, getting the university before you know before that coverage in that type of event. What did what did that mean to the university? Well, it, it meant so much uh, on on many levels. You know, the branding, the exposure, uh, the competitive side. You know, people have talked uh, for years and years about how Ole Miss baseball you know belongs you know on the biggest stage. Um, in, in college baseball because of our facilities, because of our investment. We've been close, you know, in times before. And so to kind of get over that hump, to, to break that seal uh, under Mike's leadership uh, was, was huge. You know, now we're recruiting at a high level. We signed a, a great class uh, today. Signing day opened up today for, for many sports, uh, but baseball signed a bunch of guys already for next year. So it's opened up, I think, a whole new avenue of success opportunities uh, because we broke that seal, and so now we think the best is yet to come. Now you know we want to not only go to Omaha, but but win it. You know, storm the mound in that in that three game series uh, after you win a championship. So that's the goal, and we think we can do it. And you know, we'll also look at speaking of facilities. You know, baseball, baseball. Uh, we haven't done much over there in the last couple years, and so with the success, we think there can be some opportunities around some player development areas maybe some premium seating areas to enhance baseball uh, as well and make it uh, even better than, than what it is now. Would you do anything uh, in the outfield? Would you extend uh, the, the concrete section over into right field, or, or do you like the, the presence that you have in right field with the students now? We, we like it, but we think there could be some, uh, some enhancements done, uh, especially beyond right field. You know, those tennis courts uh, provide an opportunity either for tennis or you know for something else related to baseball um, and then also you know looking at left field as well so definitely want to explore those opportunities and we, we've started that process of just really exploring uh, what the potential uh, might be for baseball. Would, uh, would it possibly include some apartments out there like uh, they're putting up in Starkville? Would you like people living maybe, in Swayze Field? Maybe, maybe. I, you know the zoning, we're not sure about the zoning uh, issues with that but uh, that's a cool feature that they're yeah. pulling off at, at Starkville, so uh, maybe that's something uh, we could look at here. Uh, we also know a, a couple of weeks ago you guys announced a, a football contract with Wake Forest with the games to be played when your grandchildren are involved, <laughs> but uh, wh where else, uh, do you, where do you guys stand with scheduling uh, other uh, Power Five conference opponents? That's a great question. Our, really our next window uh, begins in 2016. 2015 obviously we're set so we have a game uh, to, to fill for 2016. Um, I've been saying it uh, for some time now, but we're, we are really close to being able to announce a neutral site game in 2016. We're working on a home-and-home -home agreement that would cover uh, 2017 and 19, or perhaps even 18. That's kind of came into play in the last couple of days. Um, and then sprinkle in another neutral site game in that same window. And then we have a Home and home opportunity that we're looking at for 2020-21, and then you referenced Wake Forest. We also have Georgia Tech that we push back um, into the mid uh, 2020s. Uh, when your grandkids, uh, my grandkids won't be born yet, uh, <laughs> maybe yours, uh, yeah. we'll those games. But so we we have a lot a lot of things going right now, and you know, knock on wood, unless something uh, gets in the way, we should be able to announce some uh, some agreements here. Uh, to show people that, hey, we're serious about those games, and, and I think we're going to have some fun with some of the neutral site games that, uh, that we're working on, and I think our fans will be thrilled.
do you like continuing to play the FCS opponent? Do you like one of those on an Ole Miss schedule? You know, for, for now, I, I think that game works. Uh, for now, you know, obviously, um, you know, we're outside of the top four, uh, but it didn't seem to hurt us, you know, at least in the initial poll. And so I think it's something that we'll continue to evaluate uh, how it plays into strength of schedule. Um, but right now, it doesn't seem to be hurting um, those teams that are playing a 1AA game, an FCS game, um, in terms of that strength of schedule. So I think you definitely have to have one marquee non conference game. Uh, moving forward, and we'll take care of that starting in 16. And then after that, right now, we'll keep the FCS game on there um, unless we see that it's going to be a deterrent um, in the playoff uh, formula. Ross, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, an article from a national outlet about an ongoing investigation. A, a lot of the, right. I think a lot of us knew that the, there was that. But what, what NCAA investigations are ongoing right now? Is it just football and, and women's basketball? Really, really, right now where we are, Parish, it's really a process-oriented um, approach. Right now, part um, is over, um, if you will, and now it's really just a process. We we have to uh, receive our notice of allegations. We have to to respond to that uh, within 90 days after receiving that. So we're really in a, in a point where we're waiting on that notice uh, of allegations, and then we'll respond accordingly. So uh, the process has uh, has been longer than what we wanted. Um, but we're confident in how we've dealt with things and uh, we'll continue to deal with things and, and how we approach compliance and integrity and really just doing the right things uh, every single day. So uh, hopefully there's more to come on that uh, soon um, and we can get moving uh, with the next steps in, in the process. Now women's basketball also is still ongoing, is that right? Well, like I said, the, the investigative part is finished. Okay. Uh, it's really more okay. of a process-oriented where we're waiting, we're simply waiting on the final steps, and that that final step is receiving our, our notice of allegations. All right, is are, are we talking football with that as well? Is that both both programs? There, there there's a few things um, that we're looking at uh, in football. Uh, some things uh, current staff, some things uh, previous staff, and so again, process wise, those things are to be uh, to be wrapped up. Ross, good stuff, man. Thanks for being with us today. Okay, thanks for having us on, Parish.